hitting record at your end. Okay. There we go. Okay, very good. So I will start. So uh, yes. Uh, so good afternoon. Good evening, uh, friends, wherever you are. This is uh, Tex. Uh, I'm in Quebec. Uh, Annie Spade, uh, the uh, other uh, room steward, is in uh, Texas. And uh, we in the full self nurturing, healing and healing justice convergence room of World Unity Week. And now today we will be looking at the challenges of racism presented by uh, Tez, uh, Tezikia Gabriel of uh, Pathways uh, to Peace and uh, Rich uh, Chile. And uh, it's, uh, we plan a 90 minute discussion and question and answer to help those uh, who are attending, who are listening and will be listening afterwards, uh, see and experience how unconscious identifications and attachments to a false hypothesis of race and the international interna internalization of racism, white supremacy, white privilege and income inequality breaks blocks hinders and prevents awareness and experiences of wholeness and oneness. So I'll pass it on to Tezikia, who will uh, lead uh, the, uh, the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tex. My name is Tezekiah Gabriel, but people call me Tez, uh, very close to Tex, <laughs> but Tez. And I'm just honored and delighted to be here for World Unity Week and in the whole self nurturing and healing justice room with my beloved friend and colleague, Rich Sheely. And I'm gonna take just a moment to set up our time together. And our whole desire through our time today is to engage in a dialogue. And of course it can't just be between Rich and myself. We would really like to engage you in that dialogue as well. So, um, so please know that you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions, to share comments, to share your own experience briefly. And you can put your questions, comments, thoughts in the chat. And after our, our interview format, um, then we're going to ask you to join this dialogue. Um, we're hoping that you will mute yourself unless you're speaking. Um, and what we want to do today is really create a liberated zone in this sacred circle. What that means is that when we talk about something like challenging racism, people tend to kind of tiptoe around their most compelling questions, thoughts, beliefs. And uh, we want you to know that this is a safe space for all of those hard questions, all of those thoughts, those beliefs to come to the table. So together in unity, we can be more enlightened, more conscious of how we can challenge racism. So let me tell you just a little bit about Rich. Um, Rich and I together, I think we're probably around, we've done about 10 presentations together, but even more than that, um, Rich and I really love each other and we are support to one another. Um, in my quest to challenge racism for the past 50 years and through Rich's broad experience and body of knowledge around this work that we come together and we do share those hard issues and those hard questions. And I have been enlightened and inspired through those conversations. So Rich Sheely is the founder and chief servant of the Optimal Human Global Community. 
And that is a community of evolved and evolving humans of all ethnicities who are committed to doing their part to end racism as an integral part of the human experience. Also Rich is the creator of Heart Transformed, which is about ending racism through a learning system that helps people in their journey with racism awaken to the fullness of their humanity and live consciously beyond the constraints of race, racism, and white supremacy. Rich is an intuitive empath. And as I said, he has an enormous body of work focused on ending racism. So both Rich and I believe that the work to increase consciousness around um, race that will be the source of ending racism for each of us is heart work. Not head work, but heart work. So as we enter into this dialogue, we'd like to take just a moment to kind of ground ourselves and open our hearts as well as our minds. And of course, the Eastern sages say that we lead with the heart and the mind follows. So let's just take a moment to settle in, to rest, leaving behind all of that busyness that we've been about and just together breathe. Breathe a little bit more deeply, a little bit more slowly. And don't worry if your mind wanders, just bring it best back to our breath. And now when you feel ready, we'd like you to focus that breath coming in and out through the middle of your chest where the seat of the heart resides. And allow that breath to come in and out through that heart. You can't do it wrong. Just settle into that heart focused breathing. And now together, let's just see that beautiful heart within each of us, unique to each of us, with all its color, all its beauty, all its energy. Let's see that expanding, expanding and filling our whole chest, our whole body with that beautiful, loving, peaceful, compassionate and unifying energy. And now see that energy coming from each of our hearts, expanding beyond our body and connecting to all in this sacred circle and beyond, bathing the planet with that beautiful loving energy and nurturing peace and unity with everything it touches. And now see that energy expanding into the universe and beyond, blessing all and everything in this beautiful all that is. We are connected never separated, connected with all that is. And as we feel that enormous oneness and unity, we can bring ourselves back to this place and time, this sacred circle, as we begin this dialogue. Mm. 
<laughs> so rich. So grateful to be here with you today. <laughs> My beloved peace brother. Yes, yes, we are. I just want to come uh, and remind everyone, as Chaz has said, this is the love zone. This is the oneness zone. This is where we can feel ourselves being connected as a function of our being aware of the energy that completes our humanity. Hopefully, all of us here today know that there is a series of personal fields of energy surrounding our biology that completes our humanity. So it's appropriate that um, we're in the whole self room with healing yes. because our whole self is here, whether we are in touch with it or not. If you aren't aware of it, we'll be talking more about it. And as we continue to dialogue, we'll help you to understand. Strange enough, our government, along with other governments around the world, have been studying these personal energy zones for roughly 50 years. And uh, for their own reasons, they have not spoken about it widely, but they have been uh, giving grants and studying it for about 50 years. As a matter of fact, um, I have a, in this vast uh, inventory <laughs> that Ted spoke about, I have a tape of the original lead scientist who led the first project. And on that tape, she says that she gave it the name human biofield. Now, it's not actually a biofield because these are energy fields, different levels of energy with different levels of intelligence for different purposes, managing the biology and trying to keep the biology in a homeostasis kind of position. Uh, but because we, the humans are so hard headed, wanting to do things our way, then we create problems in our energy. And when we create problems in our energy, we create problems in our health. We create problems in our physical health, our mental health. And we are seeing the outworking of that as we look at America today as we uh, concern ourselves with things that are not helpful to our whole self nurturing. And that goes on all, all of the time. And I, we, we won't have enough time to really talk about that so much, but I'll share with you as much as I can uh, to make sure you have an understanding. Tess also mentioned that I am an intuitive empath. Now, if you research that, you'll probably find that uh, the social uh, psychologists and others who might be interested say that about 2%, maybe as much as 15% of the population are empaths. Now, <laughs> the scientists can't figure out really what that means. They really can't tell you with, with um, explicitness what it means to be an intuitive empath, but let me give you a complimentary thought from the Bible, and I think it will help you. In the 11th verse of the fourth chapter of the book of Ephesians, you will read, he gave some to be apostles, he gave some to be prophets, he gave some to be evangelists, pastors, teachers, and so on. And the purpose of that group in a Christian family is to edify the body of Christ or help them better understand how to be aligned as um, 
disciples of Christ. In the same way, in a non-religious way, empaths are given to the human family to show the way to the fullness of humanity. And the reason for that is because of intuitive and empathic abilities, you have the ability to discern intelligence, information that others can't imagine to be there, can't imagine to be true. So empaths are by nature servants here to serve others, here to show others how to be aligned with the universe and what it's called for. And where we're going is to a consciousness of oneness. The, the mind of Christ from a religious point of view is a consciousness of oneness from a scientific and spiritual point of view, a conscious of oneness is what you need when we start talking about whole self, when we start talking about unity of humanity, you need to come at that from a consciousness of oneness because a consciousness of oneness does not permit division, does not permit separation. The consciousness of oneness is defined by love, defined by compassion, defined by forgiveness, defined by the idea that there is no other. If you ask me how, how different I am from any other human being, I will say to you, there is no other. It is the same energy the same energy expressed uniquely in whoever you are. Unfortunately, we are born into cultures that teach us that we are separate, that we're unique. There's nobody like us. Well, that's true, but it is true in the context of oneness because it is the same energy. No matter how distinctive you have tried to make yourself, the energy that you are made of is the same energy that any other human being is made of. And also it is the same energy that the universe we live in is made of. So the idea of oneness is that the oneness of all life, we're all included and you don't get a choice. It's there already. It's part of who you are already. It is when, when, you, when you fold together, your whole self-nurturing, you've got it all together, your energy. And that's what it's all about. And the way in which we're going to heal and cure and end this cancer of so many traumas that we call racism is through working through the energy working through the oneness that is already there and enlivening that presence that has been dormant in substantially all people for all of the time. Racism is extremely toxic to humanity. If you are not careful, racism will take your life. And here's how it works. Every incident of racism is a trauma. And imagine over a lifetime, how many encounters of racism have incurred in your life. And it really, it doesn't matter whether you are the so-called victim or the victimizer. Remember the energy is the same. So if the event occurs, there is, a, there is a mirror trauma in both humans or all humans who are involved. For instance, take the um, craziness of the mass shootings that we suffer in America. Every time there's a mass shooting, 
everybody who hears that message experiences at their energetic level trauma that adds to the history of the trauma that is already present in their being system. I call it trauma weight. And the trauma weight is heavier and heavier over time. When trauma occurs in your energy, there are problems, perhaps because energy is intelligent. And remember the idea of homeostasis. So trauma can cause the messages that various energy systems send to each other because there's an ongoing checking. Everything is functioning as it was designed to function. Or we're having a bad day, too many traumas today. I'm going to have to slow down my messages because I don't have the um, flow of energy that is necessary to complete that message in the proper way. Or my trauma weight is so great that I will no longer be able to carry out my function. This is the end, this is the last time I will be sending you any messages. And because of that, there is an illness that is manifested at the biological level. Or if that continues, the illness becomes a chronic disease. Or if that continues, the problem becomes premature death. I'm sure that, that in this group you have heard about telomeres and you understand that telomeres are associated with stress. What does trauma produce? Stress. Now, the beautiful thing about being a human being is that we can recover. We can recover, but we must learn to use all of the resources of our humanity, which includes our energy. And we must use the energy because it is easier for the energy to be recovered than it is for the biology to be recovered. If that problem of continuing traumas have led to a manifestation at the biological level, it's much more difficult to improve your biology than it is to improve your energy. So all of that is, is very, very important. Also, we need to understand that um, racism is so difficult to, uh, to unpack and to understand because it occurs primarily at our unconscious levels. And you can easily have um, a person who appears to be egalitarian, who appears, uh, appears to be welcoming to all so-called races and that person at their unconscious levels or their multi-generational levels or their multi-dimensional levels is a rabid racist. And it's also important when you're thinking about racism to understand that we are actually living in the world of the quantum theor theorists. We're no longer living in the world of Newton. Uh, it's important to have that understanding as well. And racism does a good job of hiding itself in um, all of those different levels of consciousness and all of those different states of being. And so that's why you have problems when you have people who, who sit down and want to have a conversation about racism. It's much more at the table than most people think. It's not only the biology, biology that's sitting at the table, it's also the generations of every person sitting at the table. It's also the multi-dimensional multi aspects of the person sitting at the same table. If they're not sensitive to those things or aware of those things, they're gonna speak in a certain way that's incomplete. That is not all of what, what they have to share 
uh, about about their um, position on racism. They are only sharing what I would call 12 and a half percent or less of the story because the energy field surrounded them that completes their humanity constitute 87 and a half percent or more of who they are. So if we want to have a whole self, we got to figure out how to capture that 87 and a half percent or more that has eluded us uh, for, for many, many years. And we have not been helped by our government. We have not been helped by our, our families to understand um, that these ener energy fields exist. They are part of us. And importantly, they are responsive to us. Your personal en energy fields will respond to your voice. It is your being system. And if you're only using 12 and a half percent of it, you're selling yourself very, very short. And um, so this is uh, just a snippet <laughs> of what my work is about. And before I, before I had any understanding of what it meant to be an intuitive empath, I was doing the work of an intuitive empath. Mm -hmm. I went, this was when, I'm now 79 years old. But this was when I was in my late 20s, along with others I worked with at what was then Continental Bank. We created a weekend workshop that had energetic overtones, let's say, where I demonstrated the work of an intuitive empath, but I didn't know what I was doing. I was just I was just following my intuition and had no clue what I was doing, but we were trying to help um, people who were non-European trying to be successful in a major European organization and trying to show them how to be successful in a European environment without losing the integrity of their ethnicity. And we were very successful with this because we were working with the energy of the people. Um, and I was able to know information about people sitting around the table that they didn't know about themselves. And I didn't understand what it was or how I was doing it. I just knew I was doing it. And it was enriching, it was enriching what was happening because it, um, it was energizing the, the energy fields of everybody around the table. So everybody was enriched by that process, but I didn't have a clue what it was that I was doing. But later I came to understand that what I was doing is I was reading the information that was in the aura of each of the people as we worked with them. But I didn't know that's what I was doing. But that's the work of an intuitive empath, working with the, working with the energy of people, working with the energy of life, and reaching into those spaces that others are not aware are there and available for us. But that's the work of intuitive empath and all intuitive empaths on working with humanity to help us with alignment and help us with authenticity, the authenticity that we have with ourselves, the authenticity that we are to have with others, the authenticity that we are to have with the universe. Authenticity is critical uh, in this process of creating that whole self, process. How are we doing on time? Are we We're doing fine. And maybe I could just respond a little bit. Um, Rich, I just love, of course, everything that you said. And I think that sometimes uh, people can get lost. Because when we talk about all the ways in which we need to challenge racism from your perspective, which is so whole self, so holistic, 
that it just covers what feels like everything, right? It's science, it's spirituality, it's intergenerational trauma, it's holistic healing, it's everything. And, and so, and more than that. And so I think, um, I think that what it, what we, it can boil down to perhaps what I'm thinking in this moment is that the uh, roots of all of that are consciousness and energy yes. that are just, they are what they are, yes. they are. And, and I feel um, that both of those things are somewhat neutral. And it's what we infuse into them that creates the change or the manifestation. The, yes. um, I've been reading about the latest kind of studies in verifying consciousness and the belief that um, everything is manifest from consciousness. Yes. And of course, we cannot manifest that without the energy. Yes. So I just, again, I just uh, love what you said. And, um, and again, it's, it's all, it's so holistic, it's all encompassing. Yes. But if we can root it in that oneness consciousness, and the awareness of our energy to create, then we can move mountains in every way, and certainly we can truly end racism. Yes, yes it's, it's so, uh, so important that we uh, learn more about consciousness and energy. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's because the, we come here, whether, you, we, are, whether we are born through uh, an incarnation process or whether we are born through a religious process, we come here with a oneness consciousness. Yes, yes. And the first trauma, the first trauma is that first part of um, enculturation mm -hmm. because the enculturation process starts in the womb. One of, one of the things that caught my attention when I was doing the bulk of my research, uh, I was studying neuroscientists. And after I got to the third one, I said, well, this, this, this is interesting because they kept saying the first reality of the fetus is the unconscious of the mother. <laughs> yes. So that's the first trauma. Because that's, that's, that's the trauma that, that takes you away from the oneness to the duality of the mother's unconscious. And as you are more and more enculturated into society, the, the traumas build up because we, we are designed to be one with each other and yes. one with the universe. That's yes. what our design is. Yes. And anything that we allow to come into our being system that violates that is a trauma to the yes. existing system. Mm -hmm. So um, when, we, when we, for instance, accept the false hypothesis of race and untruth as a truth, that's a self-imposed trauma. When we run into the internalization challenge that we have of racism that we impose on ourself, when that connects with an event in society, that's a trauma. Mm -hmm. And this, con this, this continues. And when people are identified, they can be identified positively, and, and that gives you proud boys and whatever the other name they have, or they can be identified negatively, and that gives you non-Europeans who are negatively identified. 
who self-impose on themselves the idea that I am less than, that I don't have, I, I don't have the right to be a full citizen in whatever country um, that I happen to be uh, native of. When we impose those negative things on us because others have defined us that way. Mm -hmm. As humans, we are intended to be self-defining. We're intended to take our gifting and align ourselves with the universe and go forth and create. That's right. And bless others, benefit others. Mm -hmm. But if we self-impose and say, we can't do that, I, I, don't, I don't have the ability to do that, there is greatness in every human being beyond their imagination. Yes. Greatness, true greatness, the ability to create without end. We are limitless, limitless in our, in our ability to contribute. And we are empowered by the power of the universe itself That's to be right. whatever we might. You know, we, we look at our gifting and we act that gifting out um, and it should be without constraint. But too often we... Um, will impose on ourselves some sort of limitation that's not an authentic limitation. And here is the difference between the mind and the heart and the intuition. You can confuse the mind and give it a false perception, normalized, and the mind will accept that because it came from you. The mind is designed to be a servant. The intuition, on the other hand, is de designed to recognize, acknowledge, and respond to unfettered truth. It doesn't go through the mind. So uh, that's the difference. And that's why Einstein said to us that we made the mistake of confusing ourselves that the mind was a sacred gift. But yeah. he said the intuition was a sacred gift and we had confused ourselves and put it in the place of the intuition. And that's important that we, we understand that, that we have got part of, part of whole self nurturing is to bring your mind under the control of your heart and your intuition. Yes. That's a critical part of whole self nurturing. Um, so, uh, all of those things are, are so important and uh, we wanna make sure that we're doing those things. And there, there, there are challenges and challenges and challenges that racism presents to us. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that uh, we're constrained by time, but uh, we'll do the best we can. Mm -hmm. I think we have enough time and yeah. so, um, so I, I, again, Rich, thank you so much because, um, again, boiling it down just a little bit, um, I would say that our natural state is oneness, right? That's what you yes. said we came in with. Um, but in the womb, we had our first trauma. And what happens when we experience multiple traumas is that we give up we are disempowered um, or, or we can act that trauma out upon others. And so really embracing that we are powerful, we are creators, we are one with all that is. That consciousness is a field that exists that everything is created from. And it is our oneness with the creator of all that is that empowers yes. us to create yes. goodness for ourselves and others, yes. including eliminating all the artificial divisions yes. <laughs> because they are artificial constructs yes. to our oneness nature. So Rich, is there anything more you would tell us about how you describe oneness consciousness? Anything more you'd like to say about that? 
um, the first time I encountered oneness consciousness in a conscious way. I'm sure I encountered it many other times unconsciously. But the first time I encountered it in a conscious way, I was 50 years old at my 50th birthday party. And um, when it came time for me to speak, I, I stood up and moved to the place where I was to speak. And something happened and I, in a moment, I received the love of all of the people in the world that I knew who loved me. I received the authenticity of their love. I was rendered speechless. It was, it was just a wave of love that, um, it was a wave of love that as I, as I received it, and it came energetically, that's what happened. It came energetically, and it was like my, my biology turned to something close to jelly because I was, I was just overwhelmed, in, in, unable to speak. And um, I, um, my mother was coming to the podium to help me because she thought I was in trouble. <laughs> but I put up my hands and uh, it's not that I was in trouble. I, I, I understood that it was about the love. And in a trembling voice, I said, uh, there's a place that is available to all of, all of us. And it is a place that is defined by love. I can't tell you where it is. I can't tell you how to get there, but I know that that place exists. Yeah. And that was my introduction to oneness consciousness. By that time, I was familiar, very familiar with my intuition and I knew that it, there were some things that would come to me that it would take me time to understand, maybe years to understand. And it took me 20 years to understand that night what had happened. So that was my introduction to oneness consciousness. But it is, it is that kind of, it is that kind of, of consciousness that is available to every human being that's right. And you can have it right now if mm -hmm. you decide that you want to deal with yourself in that way. What that means, of course, is that you have to um, end the attachments, unconscious attachments uh, to racism and, and all other, all other um, dynamics of separation that separates you from others and that you have to positively affirm that that's that's what you're about yes when i am going through my daily life i am attempting to live my life as best i can from oneness consciousness yes and 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 not from the consciousness that, that i learned uh, it's it's a it's a, it's a difficult process. It's mm -hmm. a difficult process. Um, but it can, it can be, and it is, it is more than rewarding. Yes. It is more than rewarding yes. to be able to confront another human being in a fully loving way, no matter what, no yes. matter what has been the, difficulty or trouble that you might have had with that human being, but to meet them with love and yes. a sense of oneness and a sense that there is no other. Mm -hmm. That's, I don't know. It's, that's to perfect. me, that's, <laughs> that's extraordinary. It is. And um, yes, love is the greatest transformative mm -hmm. 
energy on the planet. And I would just add that um, the way that I remain in that oneness consciousness in my days is every morning, my intention is to bring love into every interaction. Yes. And it's just such a simple and quick um, affirmation and intention. But yes. what it does is when you're living out of that oneness consciousness, it's a very exciting thing. Um, a lot of people, when they hear about um, kind of moving into oneness, they fear a loss of identity. Yes. And, they, and instead, it brings so much rich adventure to one's yes. life to live yes. out of that consciousness. Yes to kind of move into every relationship, every aspect, everything that occurs in your daily life. When you bring that consciousness, that love into it, you just anticipate and watch the effects of that. Yeah. It's, a, it's an amazing adventure. And there is nothing lost and everything gained. So Rich, I wonder, I know that you know about this, this term, dual consciousness. Yes. And I wonder um, how oneness consciousness is different from dual consciousness. A oneness, oneness consciousness, first of all, is at a stronger vibration. And uh, oneness consciousness dissembles dual consciousness completely. Dual consciousness dual consciousness cannot function in the presence of oneness consciousness. Um, so in the presence of oneness consciousness, there is no dual consciousness. Um, there, there's, there is so much power. <laughs> there is so much power in a human being that we don't know about. And um, there are these amazing facts. So if I, if I, if I ask you how many cells are there in your biology, you may or may not be able to answer, but they're roughly going to be about 37, somewhere 37 to 40 trillion. And each of these cells carries about one and a half volts. So that means that you're carrying around something like 50 million volts. Now that's, that's one of those distinct distinctives of what it means to be a human being. Now, what is all of that power for? That's right. That's right. <laughs> and we, we, we don't, we don't use it. We're not, most of us are not aware of it, but I just wonder what is all that power for? You know, I, I know that we are limitless, but what is all that power for? <laughs> there must be a use for it or we wouldn't have it. So that, that's, that's interesting to me. Yes, that's great. I was giggling because isn't dual consciousness an oxymoron? You know, yes. <laughs> when it comes yes. to oneness, how can yes. oneness yes. be separated? So, yes. yes. So um, what would, so what would be the role of race and racism in a society grounded in oneness consciousness? Of course, I can imagine your answer, but I want to hear it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you know, there was, the, uh, you know, what, what really immediately comes to mind is a, beautiful, beautiful place with everything that you could imagine that you might want um, and beyond. And it would be like President 45 who wanted to send the people who contracted COVID to Guantanamo, except it wouldn't be Guantanamo. A oneness, a oneness, a, a culture 
grounded in oneness would make it a beautiful place, beautiful beyond what they might be able to imagine. Not only would they get healing, but they would get everything else. They just would not, they just would not be suitable, would not be suitable for the oneness society because ob obviously they have, they have failed to complete their whole self nurturing <laughs> and, and, but you would provide it in, in the most beautiful, loving, caring way. Yeah, thank you for that. And so for people who really feel like uh, moving into a oneness consciousness means giving up something that I as an, a unique individual might value, um, how would you speak to the ability to distinguish um, myself in a oneness society? Um, oneness does not um, constrain your creativity, does not constrain your ability to give, create, be, uh, not at all, but see, see oneness, oneness includes um, the capacity to value things in the right way. Yes. You're, you're not, you're, you're, you don't have a desire to value whatever you are giving and contributing to society personally, mm -hmm. because you are undividedly one with everyone else. So whatever you cr create is for everyone else. Mm -hmm. You're included, but it is oneness. You know, not not it. It, it is. It is not. You know. You, you have no desire to take personal ownership of whatever you contribute. Um, so that's the way I see it. Yeah. And I, I see it too, as giving and receiving being that beautiful energetic infinity symbol yeah. that is the same energy. Yeah. And so we recognize, um, in a oneness society that we receive the same joy, the same blessing, yes. um, by giving as we do receiving yes. and, yeah, I, I think yeah. so as well. And also, I think there is soul patterning, I'll call it, that is about our unique talents that, that really connect to our purpose here that we will never lose because yes. they contribute exactly. to that oneness society. Right. Yes. Those and are the gifts we bring. Yes. And oneness also includes the idea of non-attachment. That's right. You're you're not attached to things. You, you know you're not a, you're, you're you know you don't make what you contribute as a thing, because it is mm -hmm. it is a part of the continuous flow. I mean, there you're surrounded by you're not, you're surra surrounded by other people who have talents that we describe as greatness. Yeah. So. Okay, you okay, you got greatness, all right? But mm -hmm. brother and sister over here have greatness too. And <laughs> and, right. and 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 they're doing profound things as well. But you say, oh, that's nice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> but there's there you know, the duality means that you you have to you have to make it personal. Yes. But non-attachment says as this part of the flow <laughs> That's right. That is right. And, you know, the so often if we're talking about, you know, attachment to material things, um, that really comes out of a out of a sense of lack versus a sense of abundance that we have everything we need, which yes. is the joyful place to be. Yes. Um, the Eastern traditions call that the hungry ghost. Yeah. that we have this hole that we're constantly trying to fill with material things that never get satisfied. <laughs> In oneness consciousness, we recognize 
that abundance is our state of being. Yes. And so, um, so we have plenty of time um, to engage our audience. And so what I'd like to do before we ask our participants to engage in this dialogue and we recognize they have, have wisdom is I'd like us to take a little journey that might inform our questions, our comments, our thoughts. And so I'd like us to take a little journey into a oneness society. So I would like us just as we did at the beginning meditation to just settle into our chairs. This won't take long. And it's actually born out of um, my own experience. I had a vision as a child of um, what I later experienced as a commitment to diversity. That was the big table, the feast, and that everybody, all cultures, all, all races, all ages, everybody was at that table enjoying that feast. And that vision has carried me through all of my work to end systemic oppression, including racism. So I just want to say that vision can be a very important part of our work to challenge and end racism. So let's move to a, that journey. So just slow your breath, breathe a little bit more deeply and a little bit more slowly. And just follow your breath, let go of any other thoughts in this moment, knowing they will come back to you when needed. Bless them and bring yourself back to the breath. And now we're going to take a little journey that really isn't a journey at all because it can be experienced right now. But we're going to journey to a new society, a oneness society. So move into that place and witness that society. Look around. What do you see? What do you feel in that oneness society? Allow the emotions to flow in to your inner landscape. The sights and the sounds to be real in that oneness society. What do you experience there? What do you see and what do you feel? How does it look? And now bring that vision back to this sacred circle. And we're gonna give you a little time to put fragments of your vision, if you care to, in the chat before it leaves your consciousness. when you're ready.
If you don't feel like sharing it, you don't have to, but do write it down so that you remember. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful visions. <laughs> The visions are growing. <laughs> mm -hmm. mm, beautiful. If for any reason you cannot see the visions in the chat, please let us know so that we can read them because they're beautiful. Peace and joy and connection to the earth. Solidarity evolutionary love and action. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. People joining together. Mm -hmm. So we hope that you can hold these visions in your heart as you do your work in the world and that you are able to manifest this society through the field of consciousness that exists for all manifestation and to put your energy behind that. My friend Melvin Giles, Peace Celebrations. Peace, yes. <laughs> we just came out of our peace celebration last week. <laughs> and I love you, Melvin. And so with that, and you can continue to share as things come up in the chat. Um, you can continue to share, share as you are inspired to do so. And now it's time for you to be engaged in this dialogue. So there are not that many of us. So um, you can unmute and bring up your video if, if you're not, if we can't see you at this point and raise your hand. And, um, and Annie and Text if you'll help us identify anyone um, because we can't see the whole screen and we don't want to miss any hands going up. We, we also have, I'll just put this in since we just finished this, I, uh, on Facebook Live, um, Jeff Laporte is a friend of mine there and he wrote as his vision, pride in the educational love children have embraced to resolve within our society balance. 
Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments about anything that has been said? Any questions you have for Rich or for me or any comments or thoughts you'd like to put on the table? We are open. Tex has a question or a comment. Yes. Uh, I feel uh, very privileged at this point to have been able to partake uh, of this. Uh, Could you speak up a little bit, yes, Tex? Yes, I say Thank I you. feel very privileged at this point to have been able to partake of this uh, uh, copious, generous, and uh, uh, you know, marvelous offering uh, that uh, you have led us into uh, Ezekiel with uh, Rich. I feel particularly privileged and humbled to be receiving the, uh, the wisdom, uh, the uh, you know, long maturated wisdom of uh, rich uh, young man of 70, 79 years and uh, you know to tell us that he, he, you know his experience of oneness at fifth, at age 50 for his uh, birthday celebration and then uh, uh, work like in developing the understanding of what he felt over the next 20 years. And now, uh, nine years later, we have him able to articulate so well and with such a inspiring coherence uh, for us. I mean, I've been listening to some of the elders, I mean, like indigenous elders, uh, Patricia and, De and Davis of the uh, Choctaw Navajo uh, uh, sharing and uh, essentially saying that the way of life is the way of love. That's uh, mm -hmm. what she said. And we had two Inupiat uh, elders from uh, Alaska, uh, who both of them published, uh, each of them published a book recently. One is uh, uh, The Chrysalis and the other one, uh, the book of John, it's Catherine and John Reimer. Uh, Catherine published The Chrysalis and John Reimer published What's on Your What's on Your Brain and What's on Your Mind, something like that. Anyway, the, the two books. Uh, John Reimer was very much in the education system and Catherine was more from her personal experience mm -hmm. as someone who had uh, an experience uh, in a, one of those residential schools for, for indigenous people and going through feelings of... Uh, uh, being suicidal and eventually overcoming all, all that and, and now at over 80, like blossoming, uh, sharing in an articulated way her, her wisdom. So all this uh, to say that uh, what I'm hearing today from, uh, from uh, Rich and uh, moderated by you, Tez, like right now I even feel my whole body tingling because uh, there's uh, not only wisdom there, but there's a path to action, pathways to action, mm -hmm. to effective action. Now, listening to Rich, uh, when you talk about the inculturation that starts in the, of the fetus, what occurred to me uh, is that in that inculturation of the fetus, there is also an acculturation in the sense that while the fetus is being inculturated into this humanoid life in the culture of the mother, uh, the acculturation from the culture, like as spiritual beings, we're coming from elsewhere. And as we're being integrated into the current culture of our milieu of life, we being, we're losing track of where we came from. Mm -hmm. We are effectively, uh, there was a word that came out sometime this week, cosmozoic, like we of the cosmos. And uh, so there's a lot of wisdom being shared uh, throughout this week when, and I, I really appreciate the, uh, 
the repeated reference of uh, Rich to the whole self nurturing. Yes. Uh, because you see, uh, I need, had an, uh, an essay published in Cosmos Journal this spring, uh, Scaffolding for a Tribal World, in which he makes the case. Uh, I think it's an irrefutable case, which is now even consolidated by the information shared by you here today. The child, the importance of the nurturing of the child to enable the child to manifest fully its full potential. And that the future for a tribal world will depend on uh, the quality of adults, of stewards we have. So far, we see that uh, uh, our stewarding of the planet, of the world, has not been that uh, that uh, super. Uh, so if we're going to have a, a tribal world, we need uh, better adults. For that, we need better children. But to have better children, it starts now. So we need to become better adults. So uh, Rich said it very well. It's now. We don't have to wait to come to a, a certain realization and then take so many years. We need to listen to the the hardened wisdom, which is now being uh, supported by science. So I think, I mean, the pathways to peace and drivability is, is in our hands now. Yes, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So Rich, would you like to comment? And I'd like to share as well. So you get to go first. <laughs> well, I, I agree. I agree with what Tex has, has said completely. And um, particularly about the child, um, because I remember a, a book I read many, many years ago. I couldn't put my hands on it uh, right now, but it was a book that uh, indicated that poor parenting reduced the IQ of the child 20 points. Um, but it is, it is uh, poor parenting also includes uh, a lot of other things uh, that are equally important. Uh, I think the science is that if, if the child does not get the right type of parenting, then they're the brain they create mm -hmm. will not be created properly. Mm -hmm. And their ability to live the life that we would have them to lead, they aren't, they aren't able to, there are certain, there, there, there are certain um, important ways to live that require during the time of, of childhood let the child be treated in the right way and have the right exposures or that part of their life um, will be minimized or completely eliminated. So mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, it's important that we, we create the right kind of spiritually inspired, energetically um, complete uh, parenting book we need, a, we need a parenting book that goes beyond the 12 and a half percent and uh, brings in all that the child needs to be fully formed as a human being by the time they reach the age of adulthood. Right now, they're being harmed primarily. Yes, and so I'll just piggyback on that and say that 85% of the child's brain is developed by the age of three. And mm -hmm. all of the trauma um, that they experience um, because of what we know about the science and the hormones that go to, into the brain that um, prohibit learning, prohibit mm -hmm. growth, prohibit mm -hmm. health. Mm -hmm. uh, children that experience trauma 
And it's not always about parenting. It's kind of what we've been talking about here today in that it can be they live in households or communities where they're experiencing violence, where they're experiencing racism and other forms of systemic oppression, that that trauma will inhibit their brain development as well. Yeah. So for so many of our young children, they start school in kindergarten behind, and it's very difficult for them to catch up um, without some real effort. And oftentimes parents are the heroes trying yes. to mitigate the kind of trauma that those children are experiencing um, that is out of the control of parents. Parenting is incredibly important, but so is um, our role to mitigate racism and the other traumas, the violence um, yeah. that also inhibit brain development. Yeah. What I really wanted to say, <laughs> because I love what you said, Tex, um, is that there is, I, I'm not sure it's with all of the distraction of the chaos that's occurring on the physical plane on the planet right now, that it sometimes masks this huge mass rising of consciousness. And those of us who are here on this call, those of us who are uh, and there's thousands that are participating in World Unity Week. Mm -hmm. We stood in line on the other side to come here for this. This is our work. And I remember when the call, clarion call came out and I agreed to come here and to incarnate through the womb. And in that coming through the womb, had the experience of knowing what I had signed up for. Because when I was on the other side, it was like a blink of the eye to come here to create the new earth that we're all called to create. That earth that is about oneness consciousness. And I had this response of, oh no, when I realized in my human form what I was coming into. And so I think it's really important to recognize for all of us that there's no coincidence that you're here. There is no coincidence that we are the ones we've been waiting for. And to that end, I just want to say that, that we are in a time when we are all students and all teachers, mm -hmm. not any of us are more so or less so than the others. Oneness mm -hmm. consciousness recognizes that we are constantly learning from everyone and everything around us. Um, and while we are learning, we know and embrace who we are. So that was my, what came to me, <laughs> Tex, thank you. Yes. yes. Other questions, thoughts, comments? Well, I just, I'm sorry, I just want to acknowledge, like, uh, I forget what the title of this is, Challenges of Racism is, yeah. the, is the title. And, um, wow, <laughs> I mean, just the way that this uh, has been worked, um, text made reference to grandmother Patricia Ann Davis's um, offering in this room yesterday, and you know, definitely challenges came up in our conversation over there. And she just came back to what's, you know, whatever traumas we've experienced, you know, including he also called in um, Catherine Reimer's experience of having been taken from her home and given a different name and suffered so much trauma and abuse as a child. And yet she's just written this book, The Chrysalis in her 80s, you know, and is here at World Unity Week um, offering um, that what Patricia Ann said yesterday was um, 
you know, whatever we've experienced that the deepest part of us is the natural order, which is exactly what Rich has been talking about today. And I mean, that, that is the pathway home. I mean, we, we've had some conversations over these last weeks getting ready for this. I can't even say who they were with, but, you know, some, some uh, conversation about, you know, there are, there are things going on that we need to look at and address, you know, and, but we were thinking of it, we came to think of it more like, well, yeah, you got to bandage that. You got to do something to that. But the bigger thing we need to do is look at our agency, at our sense of purpose, at, at yes, we are the ones that we've been waiting for. And so what is that vision? You know, vision, I heard that word used uh, today. And that's just so huge, so powerful. Um, that is the power that, um, that we're, we're needing to tap into and waiting for. So thank you so much for taking the time to really articulate that in a really <clears throat> profound and um, uh, deep way today. Yeah, about this topic, which as we all know, can be just <laughs> such a hot button popping yeah. all over the place because yeah. it's it's there. There's There is a lot of triage to be done, but at the same time, we got to hold to the, the, the natural order as our indigenous wisdom teaches us all over the world. Indigenous elders have been pulling this up for us that we need to, to recognize that, that that cosmic vision of the oneness, which now science gives to us. Yes. Like we yes. intuited that, yes. you know, the, yes. the spiritual warriors have, have a, intuited that for for um centuries if not thousands of years actually when you look at beautiful yes, caves yes. painted and we're about to go Absolutely. to Monday man tonight you know and and hear yes. about ritual burials fifty thousand years ago and all of that i mean we've known that's in that too is is deep in our ancestral yes, uh, yes. awareness so yes. anyway just thank you for such thank a you. deep and rich uh, conversation about this topic. Thank you for sharing that, Annie. Rich? Yes. Did you, I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? You, you, you heard my, you, you heard my self-talk. <laughs> I'm not surprised about that, Rich. <laughs> so maybe I can move into the closing and then Rich, um, any last remarks after that. So okay. I just want to close with honoring you, my dear brother. Um, thank you so much, Rich. Uh, thank you also to everyone who has lived this experience with us. Thank you, Tex. Um, thank you to, um, to all of you um, for being open to this conversation. Um, Rich, you know, I speak for myself as well as many others that I am a better person and ins more inspired, hopeful, and more enlightened human being as a result of our relationship and the wisdom and the work that you've shared. So I just want to honor and thank you for this time yes. together. And then Rich, any closing remarks? Um my intuition has been bugging me about this throughout this conversation and dialogue. So I'm going to speak it. Um, part, of, part of oneness, a, a, a critically important part of oneness for me is forgiveness. And um, text reminded me when he started talking about children uh, and racism in children, because when I, um, the other thing that happened when I learned that the first reality of the infant was the unconscious of the mother, when I learned that because of who I am, I was able to consciously forgive Europeans for everything that had been done to me and everything that had been done to my people. 
And when I say forgive, I mean complete forgiveness, no residue. But okay, got that, that's done, on to the next. <laughs> but that's, that's, a, that's a critical part of oneness because without that forgiveness, you don't have oneness, you can't have it. And so uh, I think that uh, it's important to share that from time to time because um, it helps it, it, it helps to heal others who are struggling with their own authenticity of, of whatever has occurred in their life. But um, I'm not the one you, you have to be concerned about. I forgive. Yes. Yes. And that forgiveness frees up all of us yes. to come together to in solidarity to yes. do the work that needs to be done. Yes. And Rich, I know you're launching a lot of new work where people have the opportunity to come in um, to get deeper into your work and to, to learn even more from you. Can you talk a little bit about that work and how others can find you if they're interested? Yes, yes, if they're, if they're interested. Um, well, first of all, you, you can find me at um, rich at the optimalhuman.org or you can find me at rich at hearttransformed.org, either one. Um, and I am uh, going to be uh, doing virtual programs. They're seven week webinars. Uh, where I go through um, uh, many topics uh, more deeply, you know, how racism came to be and um, racism and language and media, which is so important. Um, it, it is unfortunate that the language we speak um, every day continues to be the language of slavery continues to trick us um, into um, the box, the box of racism and uh, the imperatives of the status quo uh, that want us to live life as if we were in the 50s. Uh, we, we deal with that. Um, we deal more deeply with uh, racism and uh, health problems that it causes. Um, also, um, we deal with uh, how to begin the process of releasing yourself from racism and all of those, all of those things. Uh, so uh, we deal with all of those things in depth, but what is, what is more important, we deal with them not only intellectually, but we deal with them energetically because that's where the racism hides, energetically within your being system in those energy fields that surround your body. And it's, it's important because people who offer programs that only deal with the intellect don't deal with the, the real root of racism. It's in your energy, hiding in your energy, and it takes special training uh, to release it. And it is that, it, it is those blockages and misdirections of energy that create real problems for you in becoming fully authentic, authentic spiritually. It's unlikely that you're going to be spiritually fulfilled if you don't first deal with the traumas from racism that disrupts your energy fields and, and how they are ordained to flow naturally. So uh, I welcome uh, anyone who would uh, like to get involved from that point of view. I also do the same information in one and a half days. Um, uh, the, the seven week series is 10 and a half hours, one and a half days. I can do it in, in 10 and a half hours <laughs> as well. <The> marathon. And, <laughs> right. And I'm also uh, opening up this intelligence to uh, small businesses, corporations, uh, because one of the, the greatest difficulties that corporations have is trying to figure out 
how, how to be more productive and more profitable. And part of the reason that they're having that difficulty is because they're not dealing with the issues of racism in their corporate cultures. And it's just a very complex kind of thing. Imagine you have four people sitting around the table. It's not just two people and their intellects having a dialogue. You've got the, 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 you've got the unconscious of, of each person. You've got the multidimensional aspects of each person doubled. So you've got all of these different places that um, information is coming from that ends in their daily behavior, only part of which are they aware of in their waking consciousness. All of the rest of it is going on in their unconscious, but it is influencing their behavior in terms of what they do. So if your energy is out of whack, you're not going to be productive. You're not going to be able to give your all. So these are things that corporations need to understand. And people, people now are acting out unconsciously. People, people after the pandemic are not going back to some of those jobs that had bad cultures. They're not going back to those jobs. They're looking for new jobs and they're looking for jobs with the right cultures. And too often the leaders of, of these corporations have been so busy making money they haven't taken the time to learn about what's going on with the energy of people and the unconscious of people. So they're hamstrung. Yeah. Thank you. So Tex put Rich's um, email in the chat so you can take note of that. I also put my email in there if for any reason you'd like to contact me. And um, what we are all being challenged to uh, end racism. The call has gone out and what Rich is offering, which I think is the offering of ending racism is liberation. So I'm just gonna close with one of my favorite quotes from Lila Watson. And Lila says, if you've come to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you've come because your liberation is bound to mine, then come and let us work together. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of this. Um, thank you, Rich, for inviting me in once again. And, um, and I look forward to our next connection. I as well. Thank you all. Thank, thank you for, for being part of the programming in uh, all self-nurturing and healing justice. Thank you, Annie, on the uh, tech for Facebook Live, which now we can end. Yes. And uh, uh, so we've been sharing a bit uh, from Compassion Game. We've shared uh, outwards to other uh, groups and website, Unity Earth Community. I've done that. I've also shared on uh, on Twitter. So I think we need to uh, leverage, like uh, put it out there. And I'd like to add that uh, while uh, Rich was speaking about oneness, it occurred to me that uh, the importance of oneness is like, we all know we have one body. We have trillions of cells, you know, apparently. And uh, now the cells are individual cells and yet makes uh, one body. And we all know what happens when one cell gets out of hand? You know, it's called cancer in a way, you know? So yes. I think it's crucial that uh, as a uh, humankind, we come to the realization of our oneness because it's only uh, when we come to that realization that we will really uh, activate this evolutionary love, this conscious mm -hmm. uh, revolution, which will yes. uh, uh, impel us to uh, collaborate in solidarity. Because if we're in oneness, then we can collaborate in solidarity with a common vision of a culture of peace, with a common vision of uh, ecological tribability, with a common, a common vision of equitable, sustained prosperity, for generations present and future, yes. while also 
mindful of individual flourishment because we need individuals. You know, uh, yeah. we talk about oneness, and I like how how Rich uh, uh, underlined that. It doesn't mean that when we have oneness, we we all blend in and we all, you know, I mean, flowers are flowers, and yet there are flowers all all the colors, you know. Yes. And even the greenery, I mean, greenery is greenery, yes, but we have leaves of different shapes and sizes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it's, it's I mean, oneness is, is, is uh, crucial, you know. We have to come to that yeah. because uh, yeah, our, how can I say, either we, we disappear or we will triumph. <laughs> Yes. So all about choice. Yes. All about choice. <laughs> yes. You know, and it's vibration. True. Yeah. Rich, Rich talked about vibration. I mean, mm -hmm. even the second uh, Thrive movie, uh, you know, talks, uh, brings out a, a lot about vibration. Last night we had uh, an exchange with Gary Malkin, who's been composing these uh, uh, music videos for World Unity Week. Uh, Gary Malkin is a seven time Emmy Award. Uh, and he, he explained to us how he's, when he's composing music, it's that the vibration moves the person who sees it to manifest his best self. So that's mm -hmm. his intent in composing his music, even in the little uh, clips of two or three minutes that he's uh, been sharing. It's uh, online in, a, in the trailer there for World Unity Week. So vibration is very important and this morning also we had uh, uh, Eamon Sawaf and uh, wife Rowan Gabriel of uh, Sacred Commerce like you can check sacredcommerce.com and out of there there's emotional intelligence What's, and, and he's explaining it emotional intelligence I mean it, the most intelligent thing we can do is to, to, to uplift our vibration to the highest to the optimal level of love yes. you know <laughs> yes so, it's all there and it, and it's always present but we yeah. the choice is to allow it and to <laughs> embrace <laughs> it <laughs> yes the beauty yes. of what's going on is that we're finding each other in the nosphere mm -hmm. as the Chardin foresaw that yes. the, there'll be a global consciousness and you rightly pointed out, Tezitya, that uh, uh, in this movement, in this uh, convergence in yes. uh, World Unity Week uh, through Unity Earth uh, organization happening, uh, supported by Purpose Earth, uh, there's an emergence. Mm -hmm. People are converging, but out of there, there's this emergence of the mm -hmm. new paradigm. And a mm -hmm. paradigm saying, we've got to do something. We you know, something that, that will be, uh, that would enable us to flourish. For us to flourish as an individual, I mean, the environment around us, and you touched on it very well, that the child is not just a product of the uh, unconsciousness of the mother. The child is a product of the environment. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and to remember that, that, I mean, the beauty of World Unity Week is that it is a symbol or of, it is a microcosm of a much bigger movement um, that is occurring all around us if we yeah. just choose to see. Yes. It's like an expression of it, right? That's right. <laughs> I love those expressions <laughs> because <laughs> they inspire us. They help us to not feel so isolated mm -hmm. in our work to yeah. create the new earth. Um, yeah. And they provide, as Tex said, that, that collaborative energy that is, um, is synergistic. It's not two plus two equals four, but two plus two equals five, six, seven, and eight. Yes. <laughs> in its yes. power to create. Um, yeah, yeah. Right. I've seen so much encouragement over these days, people feeling so encouraged by finding one another and yes. sharing these yes. conversations. So thank you both again so thank much. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Right. Thank you. For, for asking to be in this room. We're, we're, <laughs> yes. Thank you for asking to be in this room. Because we reached out to so many and um, you guys just came in spontaneously, <laughs> which was beautiful. Thank you to Rich for that. your work. Thank you, Melvin, for listening in, even if you uh, driving, uh, listening in on your phone. So it's good that Melvin, uh, you know, is still there because yes. the more the merrier and the more the, the more synergy there'll be. Yes. There you, you got your thumbs <laughs> Thank up. You. Yes. Thank, yes. You, Thank you. Thank you, Melvin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dizika. Thank you, Rich, again. Yes. Thank you, thank you, thank Lots you. Thanks. I heard all, right. all of you. <laughs> Until we meet again. Yes, yes, yes exactly. we're meeting, we're jazzing. Our souls are jazzing. <laughs> now we just have to meet in uh, a bit more in real life. All right, yeah. very good. All right, y'all okay. take care. All righty, bye-bye. Bye-bye.